We've learned a lot about uh, sensory physiology in the abstract. Uh, let's talk about one of our senses. Let's talk about the sense of touch. Now, the sense of touch is more complicated than I'm actually going to cover in detail in this particular lecture. <clears throat> uh, most of your uh, sense of touch, those neurons, uh, their endings are found here, are found here in the layer of the skin called the dermis. Okay, the epidermis, this is the area that is stratified squamous epithelium, and this is the area where um, <clears throat> the cells are constantly being made and then rubbing off the top. This area in here is mostly a type of a connective tissue, and this is where we will find the different touch receptors. We also have receptors for temperature and for pain um, in the dermis. Um, the, uh, the, the sense of touch, though, is activated by mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors that give you your sense of touch, they allow you to experience when pressure is applied. And uh, your sense of touch has got some uh, mechanoreceptors that are very good at detecting very light touch, like when there's a mosquito that's walking around on your arm and about to bite you. And then there are other sensory receptors that allow you to sense really strong pressure, like, like if, if something was really pushing hard on your wrist. Um, mechanoreceptors have a quality that in general, they adapt very quickly. And you, it, when we met in real life, there was an entire lab on adaptation, but I, I don't know that you will have that lab. So let me explain what I'm talking about. Um, if you are experiencing pain right now, um, that pain sensation generally will just keep going unless whatever is causing the pain goes away. Okay. However, um, your sense of touch is largely not that way. Uh, right now, I am wearing a necklace. I actually can see that I'm wearing a necklace. But if you ask me if I'm wearing a necklace and I close my eyes, I can't feel it. Um, if you're wearing a necklace or a wristwatch or something, <clears throat> you probably can't feel it either. That is why magicians, those street magicians, it's so easy for them to steal someone's wristwatch because as long as you don't feel it moving across your skin as it leaves, you don't know whether it's there or not. Or if you tell someone, oh, you lost an earring, we always have to reach up and go, oh, is it gone, right? or why sometimes people my age can forget they've got their glasses on the top of their head. You don't feel it anymore. That's called adaptation. And adaptation is one of the ways that life can make it so that if something is not critically important, we are not distracted by it. There's no need for me to know whether or not my necklace is still there. That's not life or death. Pain, pain is kind of important. All righty. So mechanoreceptors have got another really important function. My cat. Another really important function, and that is it allows you to detect blood pressure. This is on the next exam. Write it down, okay? Here, in right above your heart, right here, there is the biggest artery of the heart. This is the beginning of the aorta. It makes this kind of curve sort of like a candy cane, right? That's called the aortic arch. And in the aortic arch, and also up here in the carotid arteries, there are mechanoreceptors, and they measure your blood pressure. How do they do that? Well, mechanoreceptors sense mechanical forces like touch or stretching. The mechanoreceptors in the aortic arch and in the carotid artery, they test how stretched they are. Your arteries are stretchy. We learned that back when we learned tissues and we learned connective tissue, right? Your arteries are stretchy. And so when your blood pressure is high, they get stretched a lot. And the, the cells that are in the wall that are the mechanoreceptors, they're being stretched a lot. And so they fend, send out action potentials. Remember those little clicks like a clicker? They send out action potentials fast. And when action potentials get sent out fast, then your brain goes, oh, my blood pressure must be high. 
I will tell the heart to mellow out so that my blood pressure goes back down. You should know that the mechanoreceptors that sense blood pressure are called baroreceptors. You should know that baroreceptors are mechanoreceptors that sense blood pressure. Yeah, make sure you know all of that. Now, also out here in the same areas, not in exactly the same spots, but in the same areas, in the aortic arch and in the carotid arteries, slightly different spot, um, there are also chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptors, they don't sense blood pressure. Blood pressure is stretching, blood pressure is mechanoreceptors. These chemoreceptors sense chemicals. And we will learn that the chemicals that are being detected by these chemoreceptors here and here, they are detecting how, how the pH of your blood and how much carbon dioxide is in your blood. The pH of your blood and the carbon dioxide in your blood would be telling those chemoreceptors, ooh, we're exercising. So the heart should beat faster and you should breathe faster, okay? So chemoreceptors sense chemicals, pH, and carbon dioxide, CO2. The baroreceptors are mechanoreceptors. They sense blood pressure right down on the exam. All right, now we're talking about our sense of hearing and balance. First of all, it's important for you to know that the ear, the, the whole, all of the equipment that does the ear, that does both things. It gives us our sense of hearing, allows us to experience sound, and it also tells us which way is up. It tells us whether we're spinning or holding still. It tells us whether we're tilted or not tilted. It tells us if we're accelerating, like, like if a giant just picked up the house and is like moving it up the street. All of that is your ear. <clears throat> so mechanoreceptors allow us to hear and give us our sense of balance. Please review your understanding of the ear. Oh gosh, I hate this. This should not say eardrum, it should say tympanum, right? All right. So the pinna, that's also known as the oracle, that's the job of that part of the ear is to capture sound waves and to focus them down into this little tube here, the auditory canal. And it's focusing those sound waves. Sound waves, by the way, they are not electromagnetic waves like light. Sound waves are actually molecules moving. One of the reasons why we can actually feel a loud, deep bass sound, we can actually feel it, is because it actually is the movement of particles of matter. And sound waves will actually cause the vibration of your sternum. So you'll actually feel a real deep, loud bass sound. So those sound waves are being focused down into the auditory canal so that they will hit the eardrum. This thing, the tympanum, is a sheet of tissue and it completely seals the auditory canal. So water that goes in here, if you've got a normal tympanum, water does not go into the middle ear. It does not, right? Now the middle ear here, the, the eardrum is going to vibrate uh, because the sound waves are, are causing it to vibrate. But the vibration of the tympanum, the tympanum is very, thin, and so the vibration is small. Uh, that vibration will be amplified by the bones of the middle ear, and the bones of the middle ear hold the ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and their job is to amplify that, that motion and turn it into like a pumping kind of motion here where the, oops, here where the stapes meets the, um, here where the stapes meets the oval window. And then that pumping motion will cause a fluid wave to go out through the cochlea and then come back the other way. And then sound waves will die here at the round, here at the, sorry, here at the round window, okay? So the job of the outer ear is to capture sound waves and to send them to the tympanum. The job of the tympanum is to vibrate. The job of the middle ear is to hold the malleus incus and stapes so that they can uh, amplify that, uh, 
vibration and turn it into a pumping motion at the oval window. And the oval window is the divide between the middle ear and the inner ear. Where's the inner ear? The inner ear is actually hidden inside of the temporal bone, inside of that uh, osseous labyrinth, right? The bony labyrinth. So if I wanted to do surgery on your cochlea, I would actually have to use a bone saw to cut open a part of your temporal bone. Um, now, the cochlea is a part of the inner ear that allows you to experience sound. Uh, the vestibule and the semicircular canals are the parts of the inner ear that allow you to experience uh, motion and balance and which way is up and acceleration. And all of that inner ear stuff, those are all mechanoreceptors. Let's talk a little bit about ear infections in children. Ear infections in children are very different from ear infections in your dog. Ear infections in your dog, they're out here. Ear infections in children generally are not. Typically an ear infection in the child is actually not even a bacterial infection, not usually. Usually it has to do with this thing the eustachian tube. Now, it's important for you to remember that the middle ear cannot, it is filled with air and a little bit of liquid, okay? It cannot, if air builds up in here or liquid, that air or liquid cannot leave this way. It can't. Why? Because of the eardrum. So when extra fluid builds up in here or extra air pressure is in here, the only way that it leaves is by going down the eustachian tube. And the eustachian tube will drop off that liquid or that um, fluid into the back of your nose. Okay, the nasopharynx is where this thing is going to drop out. Now, think about you've got a head cold. You've got a head cold, you've got a really bad virus. What's gonna happen? You get a runny nose and your nose gets stuffy, right? Now, if you're a little kid, there is also extra fluid being made by the middle ear and this thing also swells shut. So the extra fluid that builds up in the middle ear, it cannot leave in its normal way through the eustachian tube. So it ends up pressing on the back of the eardrum. Have you ever accidentally touched your eardrum with a Q-tip? Ow, okay. When extra pressure builds up in here and pushes on the back of the eardrum, it causes a lot of pain. And that is what we experience as an ear infection when we're kids. I still remember one time having an ear infection, laying on the couch in incredible pain from an ear infection when I was like, I don't know, it's probably four or five. I still remember it. It was that bad of pain. Um, by the way, you experience a similar thing every time you have an altitude change. If you drive up to Big Bear, then you will feel your ears pop. What is that about? That is, as you go up higher in altitude, air pressure is lower, but you're bringing sea level air pressure in your ear. So as this pressure gets lower, then sea level pressure in your ear is too much. It pushes on the back of your eardrum. You feel that pressure in your ear. And sometimes sounds will get duller and then you'll yawn or something and suddenly you'll hear a pop. What is that pop? That pop is the air suddenly leaving through your eustachian tube and now you've recalibrated so the pressures are the same on both sides until you go up a little bit higher and then it has to happen again. Alrighty. We will start here at the beginning of our next lecture.